All right, if you have your Bible, turn to the book of Ecclesiastes with me this morning, please. Chapter 12 and verse number 8. Ecclesiastes, chapter number 12 and verse number 8. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse number 8. The infallible text says, Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, all is vanity. Father, I pray that you'd anoint your word as it goes forth, Lord, for the purpose that you intended. It shall not return unto you void, but it shall accomplish that which you please and prosper. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. We are begotten by the Word. That's for, Therefore, Satan assaults the Word. You're begotten by the Word of God. Not one jot or tittle shall pass till all be fulfilled. Therefore, it becomes a target of the devil. So a lot of folks today, they go to the church house, they hold a book in their hand that says Holy Bible, but they don't believe it because they think it's full of errors. And so they're completely confused and they begin to turn to other sources, so-called of spiritual wisdom, which means that they go to the holy books of the Hindu, and they go to the holy books of, uh, of Rosicrucianism, and they go to the holy books of the Muslim, and they go to all of the holy books on this earth outside of the Holy Bible. You can take everything that calls itself a holy book outside of the Holy Bible, Pile it up and weigh it together and it will weigh nothing. It is nothing but empty. There is no power and no message in it from God. Solomon wrote three books, folks. He wrote the book of Proverbs. Not all of them, but many of them. This represents the wisdom that God gave to Solomon. He wrote the Song of Solomon, one of the most beautiful books in all the Bible, full of the allegorical interpretation and manifestation of God and His Word to mankind. He wrote the book of Song of Solomon, and it is a beautiful book, and it represents the love that Solomon had for God at one time when he walked this earth. Then he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes when it came to the end of his life. And the book of Ecclesiastes, in many places, is a bitter book when he reflects back upon the failures of his life, and it represents the humanity of Solomon. Solomon was all things, as we understand. He was quite a man. I don't believe there was ever one before him or one since him that was quite like Solomon. This man lived 3,000 years ago. And so when he uses the word vanity, he uses a word that has a big meaning. It has a, it has a profound meaning in Hebrew. It is the Hebrew word Hevel. The Hebrew word Hevel means vapor or breath. It means the getting of treasures by a lying tongue. It means a vapor driven away. It means of what is evanescent. Unsubstantial, worthless vanity is of idols. It means heathen observances. It means wealth gotten out of vanity, not by solid toil. It means of the fruitfulness, the fruitlessness of all human enterprise and endeavor. It means into a lifeless existence. It means for naught in vanity have I spent my strength. They disquiet themselves to no purpose. This is from Brown, Driver, and Briggs. Hebrew lexicon, one of the most respected of all of the Hebrew lexicons. Bible students, the first year when they go off to begin to study the Bible, they are introduced to Brown, Driver, and Briggs. The Hebrew word vanity, therefore, encompasses everything that a human being can, in, that, that they can, in, that can come in contact with on this earth. It has to do with all of human emotion. It has to do with all the failures that a human being can come up against and have happen to them. Things that they have absolutely nothing that they can prepare for except their walk with God. Let me say that again for you this morning. If you try to plan out your life and have every day set out and the weeks and the months and the years and you're going to be doing this next year at this time, you're going here 10 years from now, you've got this plan 20 years down the road, you make your plans. But God Almighty is the only one 
that knows the end in the beginning. Your plans may not come about any way like you expect them to. In the past few days, we've had two suicides in this country by well-known figures. Two suicides. These suicides are by people that have reached the zenith of their profession. These are the people that everybody else looks up to and calls them their heroes or their idols or their or their or their or their, or their, their life uh, they they have a desire in life to be like them. One man hung himself and other a woman hung herself and and a lot of people have been hanging themselves and there's a list on the internet of the people that have died by hanging in the last few years by suicide. Suicide of celebrities. This is a conundrum. It's a conundrum for the news media and for the people that push this because they had everything the world says you need. They had all, <laughs> they had all the stuff that people scratch and claw and kill and run over each other and lie about each other to get. They had it. They had acquired it. They had reached that point, and yet they kill themselves. It doesn't match the uh, message that the world's sending out. The world wants you to believe that if you'll just walk the way they tell you to walk, and you'll get what they want you to get, and you'll live like they want you to live, then you can have this great dream that you young people are dreaming about today. You want what they've got. I'll tell you right now, I do not want what they have. Solomon was one of the wealthiest men that ever lived on the earth. In 1 Kings chapter 10 and verse 14, the Bible said, 666 talents of gold were brought to Solomon in a year's time. Who is connected with that number 666? There is no restraint on his flesh. 700 wives and 300 concubines. He had wisdom and he was adored. He was well known throughout the world for the great wisdom that God had given him. He had the privilege of building the temple of God on top of Moriah. Solomon, 3,000 years ago, had built the temple of God. His father David could not do that because he was a man of war. And God saved that for Solomon, his son. He witnessed the glory of God as it entered into that new temple. And the priests were trying to stand before the Lord. And they were trying to minister to God when the glory, the cloud of God came into that temple and they had to leave. You see, my dear friend, we can only handle so much of the glory of God. If you had too much of it, you wouldn't live on this earth too much longer. If God came down into this house this morning and wrapped that glory around your soul, I dare any of us would ever walk out that back door again and look into this godless, Christ-denying, dead world that we're part of today. You see, my dear friend, vanity is the absence of life. And these people that you're dealing with every day of your life, they're like zombies. They think they're alive, but they're dead. They're twice dead and plucked up by the roots. If you you don't have the Holy Ghost dwelling in your soul. You've never known what life is. You've heard about it. You've heard people talk about it. But you've never experienced it. For there is no life without Almighty God. He is the source of life. It comes from Him. He told them, he said, I am he that dwells in the thick darkness. That's a, that's a remarkable statement. What do you mean by that, preacher? It takes light to find the light inside the darkness. And the Lord Jesus Christ is the light that takes you to the light of the Father. That's why you can't find anything spiritual. That's why you hunt all over the world and go to every religion there is to try to find some truth. And there is no truth. The only truth there is is in this Holy Bible right here and it takes the Holy Ghost to lead you to that. Amen. This is the light. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. That word sanctify means to set apart unto God. If you've got the light of God's word, you've got light. If you don't have the light of this book, you're walking and stumbling in darkness. Oh, I know they say they know what they're doing and where they're going and they look down in pity upon us. Poor Bible thumping Christians. Uh, fundamental Christians. Christians, I'll tell you right now, I'll wear that badge with honor till the day Christ calls me 
from this earth. I know whom I have believed. And I am persuaded he's able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. Yes, sir. Solomon was great at one time. And then Solomon fell. But he came back. Because the book of Ecclesiastes is about his path back to God. Maybe some of you need to read that book. Maybe you need to take to heart what he's talking about. When he talks about vanity, vanity, vanity. How dark they say it must have gotten for some of these people before they passed on by taking their own life. No, it didn't get dark. They just began to see the dark. They've been living in that dark all their lives. Most people live a lie. They don't know the truth, my dear friend. The Bible said you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. There are three big words that I use to describe What's going on in the world in vain three, in vain things? Here are the three big ones. Wealth, health, and stealth. Put that away in your mind and think about it for a moment. Wealth is what they all seek after. If I can just pile enough money around me, I can buy all the things that will make me happy. But you haven't learned the lesson yet that things will never make you happy. These people that committed suicide had more things than anybody in this house will ever have. They were millionaires, people. And yet that wasn't enough to keep life in their soul. And then there is health. They say, well, have you noticed the health craze today? There's a health shop on every corner, and they go out and they work and they exercise. Listen, I ran all over this place. I ran places, my dear friend, that people don't even think. I ran and I ran and I ran. And then I rode my bicycle. I would go 22 miles in just a little over an hour. On that bicycle, we rode the bicycle. We ran all over this place, and I still got old. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Ain't nothing you're going to be able to do about that. This old flesh, the Bible said, the Bible says exercise profiteth but a little. That means a little while. But you're not going to stop Father Time. He's going to take his toll. But the world thinks the young people. I understand how you feel, young people. God bless your soul. I've been there. But you're going to age one day. And you're not going to be able to do what you do now. And that's going to come upon you. It's going to creep in one day. It's going to come in the house when you least expect it. And it's going to show up and he's going to look at you and he's going to say, I'm Father Time. How you doing? And boy, you're not going to like that. And then there is stealth. You see, we have wealth. If you pile up enough money, then we have health and then stealth. What's that, preacher? It's the lion backstabbing, running over people to get to the top. There are those over there that have climbed over you to get to the top. They'll take away, they'll steal, they'll lie. Hey, you live in a society today, dear friends, that is not what they come across as they are. They are not what they appear to be. We live in an age of lying like you've never seen it before. Hey man, everybody's got a show that they put on. But if you followed you around for 24-7, they'd see the real you. And the real you is not what you really want people to see. Hey man, lying because you hate the light. Mocking God because you don't want somebody to tell you how to live your life. Coveting. In the Old Testament, there was a man by the name of Gehazi. Do you know who he was? He was the servant of the prophet Elijah. And Gehazi was a good servant. He really was. He was a good servant. And Elisha went up and the, and, the, and, the, and the rich man up in Syria, he was healed. And he wanted to pay Elisha for what he'd done. And Elisha said, no, sir, don't want any of your money. This came from God. I don't charge for things like that. And so he turned around and he left. And he took his servant Gehazi with him. And Gehazi got a little bit down the road and he thought to himself, if I go back and tell that rich man what uh, that that my servant has changed his mind. I believe I'll do that. So he went back and he said, Now my servant has just come to his mind that there's some things that he wants to do for the Lord and he can use some of that money that you said you wanted to give him. So you give me that money and I'll see to it that he gets it. And the rich man was, well, he was willing to give anything because he'd been healed. So he gave it to Gehazi and Gehazi left out of there with money ill-gotten. Ill and do you know what happened to Gehazi? He 
came into the presence of the prophet of God. He came into the presence of one who walked with God. He came into the presence of one who prayed to God. He came into the presence of somebody that really knew the Lord. That had a close relationship with God. The Bible says in the book of Psalm that the wicked cannot stand in the congregation of the righteous. Do you understand me today? The reason that you sneak around. The reason there's no joy on your face. The reason there's no power in your life is because you're living like Gehazi. You're living a lie, dear friend. The only way you'll ever have power, the only way you'll ever have joy is to walk with God, talk with God, pray to God, and He'll become part of your soul and your life. And so Elisha looked at him and said, Gehazi, what have you done? What have you done? My soul went out when I saw you do what you did. Here's the prophet of God that saw him the moment God pulled the curtain back and let him see when he had betrayed him. He said, the leprosy of the rich man is going to be upon you now. And it was from that day forward that leprosy came down upon the head of Gehazi. Are you bearing something like that today, dear friend? Are you carrying a curse with you you shouldn't carry? Are you walking where you shouldn't be walking? Are you doing what you shouldn't be doing? What kind of life are you living? Are you living a lie? That's what I'm preaching about this morning. I'm talking about stealth. The lie. Churches today are all about a lie. They won't preach the truth. They won't preach the gospel. It's about your money. It's about your support. It's about buildings. And I don't care anything about money or buildings or support. I care about the gospel of Christ. I've only got a few days, weeks, months, or years at best left in this world. I'm getting ready to go out before God. I'm getting ready to meet my maker. I'm getting ready to stand in judgment. And make no mistake about it, your money doesn't matter to me. Your walk with God is what matters. Amen! There are those today, all you hear, money, 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 money. You think God can't get along without your money. The scripture talks about filthy lucre. It's part of the lie. Do you know how it works? Well, I go to church and I give them my money so I know everything's okay between me and God. Because I put my money in the plate. Your money won't buy you a moment of grace from the Lord. When you get your heart right with God, you ever get that soul where it ought to be? You'll come into the house of God and you'll say, Lord, I'm making more than I've ever made in my life. I've got food on my table. I've got a roof over my head. I'm in good shape. I am in real good shape. And God, you bless me. I'm going to give back to you what you've given to me. When that heart gets right with God, it'll take that money and it'll say, Lord, it was yours to begin with. You've only loaned it to me for a little while. Here's your part. And that is part of worshiping Almighty God. Amen. Amen. So, we talk about vanity. But the Scripture says that sin, when it is finished, does what? Bringeth forth death. I want to emphasize the part about When it is finished, there are those folks that are, that are diagnosed with cancer. Or they have, they have, they have some kind of a disease working on their liver, cirrhosis of the liver, or something of that nature, kidney failure. Many things can happen to the human body. And it's just a matter of time before that part of the body just literally gives up and your body's finished. And so when it's done, you're done in that body. And if you know the Lord, you're leaving out of this world. In plain of words, there is a progression to it. It gets continually, it gets worse and worse over a period of time. That's the way sin operates. It starts so small, but it continues to grow and grow and grow until it's consumed your very thoughts. It's consumed your life. All you can think about, some of you sitting here right now, you're looking at this preacher, but your mind is about the pornography that you watched last night on the internet. Amen! Amen! Some of you right now sitting here watching this preacher and you don't have a clue who the Lord Jesus Christ is because you've got an affair going on with your secretary or with your boss or with your neighbor or with somebody and you're going to church and the world today says it's okay. Even the church houses today say it's okay. You remember the message that was preached over there at this last wedding in Great Britain? This fellow got up and he talked about love, 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 love. Then when you preach about it that much and that long, it has no meaning. 
until you define it and give a relationship of it and show it what it's related to, it has no meaning. If I give you the word love and let you define it, let you apply it, let you take the theology for it. Let you be the one who, who, who preaches it and teaches it. It has no meaning. If the Bible does not define it, preach it, teach it, then my dear friend, it has no meaning. What does the Bible say about love? The Bible says love rejoices in the truth. That's what the Word of God says. You say you love, but you don't rejoice in the truth. You're a liar and a deceiver. Somebody's messed you up. Somebody's messed your mind up. Well, that's what they preach in my church. Get out of it! <laughs> As my basketball coach at Rule High School said one time, one of the ball players got mad over something, and the coach, he was good at the little short quips, and he says to him, he says, get out of here and don't let the door hit you in the back on the way out. Amen. <laughs> that's what you need to do to these churches that aren't preaching the truth of the Word of God. Get out of them. You're not going to change them. They're going to change you. So when it is finished, I suggest that you take Time Magazine. The last two months that I've been to St. Mary's Hospital to have my blood checked, I go once a month. And the last two months I've been over there. They've got this Time Magazine and it's dedicated, the whole magazine is dedicated to opioid addiction. Now, I'm not up here this morning recommending Time Magazine because, believe me, they got a lot of junk in there, no question. But this is worth getting for nothing more than the pictures. To see young people with their eyes rolled back in their head. I mean, frozen in a drug-induced coma. Young people living in filth. Young people shooting up out on the street. These photographers for Time Magazine went right into the cities. They went right to where these people live. They talked to them. And the people that would talk back says, I wish I could change my way. I wish I could do something about this. It's destroying my family. I don't even see my kids. I don't know where my husband is. I'm living in pure hell. That's good, friend, for Time Magazine. I give them credit for that. The whole issue is dedicated. Shows two cops. I think it's in New Jersey, somewhere up there. These two police officers standing. And here's a man in the center. And his arms are up like this. His knees are up underneath his chin. He's all bent over. And they're just standing there like this. Like this right here. They're looking down at him. And he is in a drug-induced, frozen state. He's been carried away to the jailhouse and to the hospital so many times they know him by name. And they'll get him cleaned up a little bit and send him back out on the street and he's right back to it again. Kids, listen. When that one comes to you offering you any kind of dope, that's your enemy. When they come to you and they try to recruit you into that, that's your enemy. Leave it alone. Don't ever touch dope of any kind. For it will destroy your life. When it is finished. When it is finished. Where would you be when it is finished? When it is finished. What's working in you right now that hasn't finished? What's working on you? And you've tried to quit it. And you can't quit it. It's not finished. When it is finished. It bringeth forth death. Sin equals death. There's no other choice. When it is finished. There was a woman in the Bible named Jezebel. She was the daughter of Ethbel, a Phoenician Baal worshiper. Of all things, the king of, of Israel, Ahab, makes her his queen. She was a wicked woman. She was the one who put into the ear of Ahab to have Naboth stoned to death. Why did they stone Naboth to death? Because Ahab whined and cried about wanting the property of Naboth. Naboth says, I can't do that. It's in the inheritance of my family, which was scriptural. So he whined and he cried to Jezebel. Jezebel says, are you not the king? Are you not the king? Can you not take what you want? So they created a lie. 
They created a lie, and they set Jezebel, and they set Naboth up in front of the people. They told their lie. So you see, nothing's changed in 3,000 years. She wanted what he had, so she lied about him. There are people right now locked up in prisons right now in this country that are in there because they didn't have the money to fight the courts and to fight the people who framed them and lied on them and put them away. There are people that have paid with their life in this country because they didn't have the money to buy their way out of the judicial system. They died innocent. So they stoned Naboth to death. Naboth died. His blood ran through the street. They stoned him. Terrible death. But God's prophet saw it. And God's prophet rose up. And God's prophet said, The dogs will lick your blood. And you know what happened? Jezebel looked out the window. She painted her face. She looked out the window and Jehu, the Bible said, drove furiously. And here he comes. They threw her down from that window. And the dogs had already gathered around. You can hear the dogs howling. You can hear them salivating. The dogs were ready for her blood. They were ready for her flesh. They were coming to get her. That's the way sin operates. It'll get you to the point where it's coming to get you. It is. It's coming to consume you. And there won't be anything left in you to fight it off. You can't stay its hand. There was a rich man that died. And the Bible said Lazarus was laid at his gate full of sores. Lazarus and the rich man both died. The Bible said the angels carried Lazarus into Abraham's bosom. The Bible said the rich man died too. And listen to what it says. In hell he lifted up his eyes. If that's not a descriptive term, I don't know what is. He was in hell and he lifted up his eyes. Where am I? That's what's going to happen to a lot of people. They're going to find them, themselves in a place where your rebellion, your rejection of Christ has brought you to a devil's hell. And you'll lift up your eyes and you'll scream, Where am I? You're where Christ rejectors go. He lifted up his eyes in hell. The Lord Jesus said plainly, there were flames there. The rich man said, I'm tormented in these flames. In hell, he lift up his eyes. Where are you? Where are you, children? Where were you last night? Where were you last week? Where will you be tomorrow? Where are you? Solomon said, life is vanity. It's like a vapor. It's like the... It's like the have you ever been up early enough in the morning and sat on the porch and there's no fog? And then at a certain time, the fog just rolls in. How many have ever seen that happen? And then the sun comes out and burns the fog away. It's strange, isn't it? When you first get up, no fog. Then the fog rolls in. Then the fog's burnt away. That's your life. You rolled in for a while, and now you're gone. You ever watched anybody die? You ever been in the room when someone passes away? You ever been around that? No drum roll, no bugle, you know, none of that. What happened? Just a very quiet exit. That's it. Last breath, and it's over. That's how close every one of us are to eternity. Our life is a, and we're gone. Are you ready for that? How about your children? Where are they today? What are they doing? Are you ready? When's the last time you had joy in your life? When's the last time something jumped up inside you and said, Hallelujah! And you felt something move. You felt something stir you like you hadn't felt in a long time. When's the last time that happened? When's the last time? Long time, preacher. You can get your joy back. You can get, I'm going to tell you something. It's a hard road to hoe to try to do everything else than get your joy. What you need is your joy and then take care of everything else. That joy will prepare you for the work of the Lord. Get your joy first. Get your joy back. What do I do, preacher? Ask Him to give it to you. Say, Lord, I want my joy back. 
They laid their hands on me this morning. I didn't know they were going to do that until they told me out here in the foyer when I came in. What did I do? I said, hallelujah. <laughs> Let them all pray for me. Let the whole church lay their hands on me. Let the whole town, every born-again believer in this town, line up. Glory to God, pray for me. I want you to pray for me. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Wouldn't you want that? Amen. Well, why don't you come down here this morning? Why don't you ask God to give you joy back? Because I think it's gone from a lot of you. Joy is gone. You ever know what the joy of the Lord is? How many of you know what the joy of the Lord is? There's nothing like that joy. Isn't that a wonderful thing? You can't tell anybody about that unless they know what you're talking about. There's just something just jumping up and down inside of you. You feel so you feel so free, so light. You just think, my goodness, is eternity going to be like this? Hallelujah, it's going to be better than that. And that is the earnest of your inheritance. That is the down payment. That's the Holy Ghost in you. Jumping and leaping because of the victory that Christ won at the Calvary. Amen. Ask Him to give you joy back. Father, in Thy name we pray. I've delivered my soul. I've preached what You gave me, Lord. I'm at peace now. There's a, good, there's a goodness in my heart, Father. There's, I'm doing what I'm called to do, Father. And I, I, have, I have great peace in that and I have joy in it. Amen. It's not a labor. It's a joy. Thank you, Father. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for reaching down into hell and pulling an old dog like me up <laughs> and saving my soul. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, name, now I pray for my brothers and for my sisters, for those who know you. They know they know you. They know without a doubt they know you. But they also know their joy is gone and they want it back. I pray for that this morning. In Jesus' name. What are we doing, brother? What are we singing? Page 401.